in a sense, you kind of inevitably need good things dissonances because in our unconscious these ideas float around. Uh, you know, maybe you're pushing the barrel a bit hard. It's the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why we have romanticism in the West, you know, uh, as the countervailing influence. So, you know, we've got pantheism and uh, American transcendentalism and uh, so on, and yeah, I'm sure that um, some of my fellow secular uh, Dharma practitioners had lively conversations with the fairies at the bottom of their garden. But, uh, but I think one of the issues that has come up, particularly in this uh, pedigree of um, you know, continental philosophy, is the idea that, of course, this, the, in, in terms of Western cultural history, uh, the transcendental factor is God. And um, as Nietzsche noted, um, the deity didn't quite make it into the 20th century. Uh, he popped his clogs. And, uh, and so what I think Nietzsche was getting at there, and so many others Sartre, was that ultimately uh, that transcendental idea of you know, the idea of monotheism just doesn't survive uh, critical examination. Or, or more particularly, it doesn't survive uh, the cultural development that has occurred, that there's a sort of self-denying ordinance in uh, Christianity, because that's the main influence on the West. And uh, it's ended up uh, with a crisis of its own making, from going from Catholicism to Protestantism, and Protestantism already itself contained uh, the seeds of secularism. Which, which I agree with. What I, do, what I don't agree with there is, is that that can be used to infer to the, the <clears throat> to the Buddhist situation. I think that there are, there are some some very important uh, differences. Ba the basic important differences between the important difference between the transcendent the trans God, as considered as a transcendent in the West, is that God, of course interferes. He, he gets involved, he, you know, blusters and makes storms and whatever you think that God does, but in somehow he acts, he creates the world, and he does a whole lot of other kinds of things, which uh, are very hard to marry with some notion of the transcendent. And so this is why, as time goes on, he tends to be divested of all of these kinds of uh, things and becomes more like what you're talking about, like Tillich's kind of idea or something. Whereas in Buddhist point of view, uh, so if we think of Nibbana as a transcendent, I'm not, I'm not me. I'm just mean Nibbana is like the, the the highest goal, the goal of Buddhism, right? And then it's not doesn't have any of those problems. Nibbana didn't create the world. Nibbana didn't part the Red Sea. Nibbana didn't do any of those kinds of things. Nibbana, the most common, the most normal definition of Nibbana is the ending of greed, hatred, and delusion. Yeah, and to me that's an empirical claim. Is the claim that well. It's, I think, self-evident that we do have greed, hatred, and delusion, and the claim is that those things can end. Now, leaving everything else about Nibbana aside, it seems to me that's, that's a fundamental notion, and it also seems to me that that fundamental notion of Nibbana, which is not transcendent, I don't think it's transcendent in any problematic sense, but it's still, even that is being rejected, I think, by this point of view, which says, well, no, greed, hatred, and delusion actually haven't ended. So to me, that's that's a point where where where, are, where you lose me. Uh, I think I think we're back to a point we were at uh, a while back. I mean that that, that it, it is an issue of it, it can one you know inhabit the human genome uh, without um, being becoming angry. I mean the Dalai Lama, who as we all know is enlightened. Admits well, freely, he, 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 really, freely he, admits. He, he, he says he's not enlightened. Oh, does it? Oh, yeah, no, he says he's not enlightened. Well, if he's not enlightened, we're in trouble. <laughs> um, but, um, but it does seem to me that uh, I've been, I've, I've actually sat with the character for 10 days, a very famous senior teacher who everybody told me was fully awakened. And he got angry. Uh, 
Um, and uh, so I, I, did, I mean, I don't see this as a failure. I see this simply as the human condition, and that it is, uh, and that the, the falling away of greed, hatred, and delusion uh, are, you know, um, they're never absolute triumphs. They're usually, uh, they're usually, you know, pretty convincing ones. But I can't see a, a state while we're still inhabiting the human genome where we're going to be entirely, uh, entirely firewalled away from those factors because we are, they're high, hardwired into us unless you know, we're going to advance a theory of awakening whereby we completely, completely uh, reconfigure the human brain. Uh, unless, this is going to be a few. May as well, okay, it looks like you want to dive in. Unless we can say that enlightenment has moved Buddha past the human condition. Well, that's transcendence, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, to come back to it, I, mean, I think it, it, embodied in, in your assumptions there is that, you know, that there is an irreducible physicality to consciousness and to who we are and so on and so forth. But, of course, the, Buddha, the way the Buddha presented the problem is not solely in terms of the human condition. Yeah? We, we know he talked about sentient beings, mm -hmm. and it was a fundamental assumption that sentient beings come in many shapes and forms, uh, human, animal, deva, alien, whatever. So uh, this being merely the most familiar, I guess, of them. I mean, that's, that's opening up, and I don't want to kind of necessarily open up that completely, but... Uh, but uh, what, what, and I, I'm quite deliberately keeping on, keeping on coming back to this point because I think it is a very important one. The word Buddha in Pali is a past participle. It represents a, an accomplished state. So Buddha means awakened with an ud on the end. Yeah? Clearly. Yeah? And it doesn't mean in a constant process of awakening. So... I mean, this is, this is coming back to that boundary area that you mentioned before about, well, are we Buddhists or are we people who are inspired by Buddhism but would prefer to call ourselves something else or whatever? I don't, again, I'm not worried so much about the labels but just about what is actually happening. But it seems to me that that's the point where really sort of starting to step outside anything which traditionally has been regarded as Buddhist for, for the last 2,500 years. I'm just aware though before I should just say we're, we're at ten two and we are due to finish at <coughs> nine and it would be good to have uh, an opening to the floor. People are raring to go. So perhaps if you'd just like to respond and then we'll just open to whoever. Uh, yes, Bunte's last point raises um, uh, uh, <coughs> another fundamental point that we haven't so far canvassed. And which is uh, that I think most secular, I don't mean that to say secular Buddhism doesn't have a canon or an orthodoxy, but I would imagine that most secular Buddhists uh, would reject any mind body dichotomy. Uh, we are embodied spirits, if you like. Uh, we are our embodiment. And, um, and I think you know, one of the really interesting aspects of neuroscience is to show exactly how that works. I mean, I think we've suspected it a long time and um, uh, the citizen chairperson is a great expert on Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, who, you know, argued this uh, almost uh, to a point of uh, complete conclusion <laughs> um, about our embodiment and how important it is to understand uh, this lived body of experience as being what we're working with as spiritual practitioners. Um, but um, yeah, I'll just simply note that as a point, obviously a point of difference between uh, secular Buddhism and some other forms of Buddhism. Okay, so we should open to the floor. Who would like to start? <laughs> I'll stay right at that point, um, but I see the word enlightenment, I work at, because the question is, is it an absolute or is it a um, work in constant progress? I think the word is good in that enlightened means to make lighter and enlightenment is a process of getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. 
I'm using it that way. And so in a sense, what I'm, uh, the way I feel it works is in that form, and uh, I progress and have a challenge to move forward in using that word rather than an absolute, I've got there. Um, I have more enlightenment to do, is the way I see it. Um, so that's the word, but I, I'm wondering whether um, if, the, if the Buddha came to a point of, of reaching it and there, and there was no more work for him, I'm wondering why Mara appeared again. Yeah, well, that, that's why I said it's, these are stories. Uh, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not sure if I'm actually getting this across. There's no, there's no, there's no text, there's no reason why those things ever happened in any way whatsoever, shape or form. They're, there's no, any more than Goldilocks happened or Rapunzel happened. Yeah? We, but we're leaning on stories, though. We've got there, there's, there, on. there's stories which we have in the, in the, in the text. And if we interpret them as a psychological state, that's just as much of an interpretation as interpreting it as a, as a deva who comes down from the skies. Now, is it a true story or not? Well, I don't know, right? I wasn't there. So personally, in terms of its actual historicity, personally, I'm, I'm personally agnostic. I've got no idea whether they happened or not. And I don't think that we can find that out from text-critical studies or any other kind of way, right? We can simply say that there is the story there. So again, to me, the, those stories don't necessarily tell us anything at all about the Buddha or his state of mind or anything like that. What they, in fact, I think tell to me much more is about what were the uh, forms that the Buddhist community found useful for being able to present Buddhist ideas to a population. In other words, how do you dress things up, right? So it's the CGI. Yeah? It's all of those things which you... You, you dress up the movie because when people come, they want to see a lot of explosions and psychic powers and all of these kinds of things when you go and see Harry Potter. But that's actually not what the message of it is, and there, there's a message there. So to me, this is this is a kind of... this is I don't think you can infer anything meaningful at all about the Buddha's own state of mind from those stories. <coughs> Who's next? Should we have the um, microphone? Yeah. Um, Perhaps if you'd like to um, come forward a bit. Yeah, look, yeah. I've actually got a very big voice. I've got a lot of experience with public speaking, so maybe I'll just do it here without the mic. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I'm also uh, a, a, a representative of uh, secular Buddhism, uh, an even more miserable example than Wheaton here. Um, <laughs> a lifelong atheist, I called myself a Dharma punk for a very long time, uh, eventually transmitting, uh, becoming uh, a, a secular Buddhist, which I think is a great phrase. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to call myself a post-Buddhist, I'm already too many other things that are describable as post one thing or another. Uh, and I would still prefer to call myself a Buddhist as part of a reflexive, critical, self-appraising, institutionally appraising practitioner. Um, what I want to say right now, though, is this. In relation to the issue of enlightenment, which is clearly a transcendence, clearly, you know, at the nub of things, that the, the, the experience as represented by Wheaton is the thing that fits most closely to my own practice, the unending toil of battling with what I regard as being the absolutely coherent, undifferentiated mind-body-self. It's in my practice and in the constantly recurring struggle to live by, <coughs> by the five precepts that I see the truth, or what I believe to be the truth, that that's where I find the truth, uh, of the Buddha's experience. Not in a transcendent state, but in, but within and through my own practice. It never goes away. Now, I know that might sound like a singularly hopeless message to give, but I think it's one that's in concordance with our actual biological lived experience, especially as has been shown over the last decade through the findings of neurobiology. That's all I want to say. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any particular respondent you'd like for that? <coughs> Either will do. Oh, and I should have also said thank you very much, Bante and Wheaton, for this opportunity yeah. to listen to you both. I, I just wanted to um, add uh, Morris Walsh's 
attitude. Mount Lawrence Walsh was a great translator of Pali texts and a long-term uh, Theravada practitioner, and he at one point um, became exasperated with all the talk of enlightenment and suggested we talk instead of progressive disendarkment. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was a great way uh, <coughs> to talk about Buddhist practice. So yeah, I mean, I I don't I can't really see what the problem there. I mean, for me, yes, I'm also a practitioner. I also find you know look for what what the Dhamma means for me, and I also look at you know my mind and find well, there's there's plenty of you know big steaming piles of greed, hatred, and delusion to work with for uh, keep me occupied for many years in the future. I'm sure, and all of those things, and 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 this is what my practice is. Like my practice doesn't consist of you know, sitting in a room and imagining some heaven realm of Nibbana that's rotating in the seventh realm with the moon of Saturn and hopefully one day I'll go there if the pixies come and pick me up and take me. That's, that's not what my practice is. My practice also, but, but my practice also has a, an idea that, well, if, if I, have, I have actually seen at least some greed, hatred and delusion end sometimes, and I can imagine and hope what that would be like to see all of that greed, hatred, and delusion end. And I, I don't see anything in my experience which contradicts that or makes it vaguely problematical with that. My own experience is, well, hopefully that will happen one day. But let's come to another point, and it's the point of neuroscience. And, and I think this is a, we didn't really get onto this, so maybe this will have to be discussed more in next time. I think we need a conference. Yeah, <laughs> but to me, one of the prob- again, one of the problems with secular Buddhism is, is it rolls over and plays dead in front of science. I don't think neuroscience shows anything actually all that exciting or original. I mean, we can go into a long detail about all the, the brain scans and the problems with MRI imagery and all of these kinds of things, but the reality is that actually we still don't know all that much about the brain and the mind and its interaction. And the f- we, we, the fundamental questions of like, what what is it when we know something? These things have not been even vaguely touched on by neuroscience, as far as I can see. Uh, just, just I, I keep mentioning this because it's it's actually a very interesting book just came out in the last couple of years called Irreducible Mind. Absolutely fantastic if you get get a copy of it, and it really makes this case very very powerfully and at great length, citing so many studies that. that you know, the, we don't know, well, how, how did the mind make my hand go up like that? It's as mysterious as anything there is in the whole universe. Right? And science doesn't tell us that. And if, if we, if once we take that stance of secular Buddhism, I don't think we then have a standpoint to then criticize and help science. I think we've already given up the battle and said, well, if science says something, we're going we're gonna to just uh, go on with it. Right. In the back here. Um, first of all, the comment, in just the whole conversation, it reminds me of one of the teachings in the sutra where someone asked the Buddha, yeah. you know, the microphone. So, there... So there was a, a, a comment in the Buddha where someone asked the Buddha, there's a lot of monks running around saying they're enlightened. <coughs> How many of them are they that are actually enlightened? Or are they all enlightened? And I think the Buddha's response was, some are, some are. You know? So even the Buddha understood that you know, transcendence is a different thing. And I guess my understanding of the Buddha's transcendence was the ending of his rebirth, which doesn't come into the argument, but it helps to make sense of transcendence when you see that the end point of it is the end of rebirth. My first comment, question is to Bhante, which is to some degree the rise of, of modern secular Buddhism is the fault of the monks because they no longer have the some people might say the political influence but maybe people have lost faith in the practice of, of the Sangha and, and in that in a sense has led people looking for a more valid or more genuine authentic form of Buddhism again and, and I guess my comment to Winton 
is that when I see monks, it actually is a living thing to me. It immediately brings to mind the Buddha and to uh, and over two and a half thousand years of, of Buddhism, but I don't get inspired that way through secular Buddhism, which reminds me of the parable of the two darts. There was a Buddha. Um, how tall was the Buddha? Where did he come from? What colour robes did he wear? And, you know, it's an endless sort of discussion which doesn't actually lead to nirvana. And, and in one sense, it's a an intellectual spiritualism, so I don't know if it's entitled to call itself Buddhism, because you can apply it to Christianity, it's a methodology. Uh, yes, I mean, look, I think that there's, there's definitely something to that point, is that the, the Sangha tends to be, monastic Sangha tends to be a very uh, inherently conservative institution, and I think Quentin pointed out at the beginning is, is uh, deeply problematic in terms of the way that it uh, packages and you know, involves the, the Buddhism and implements it, and there, there are serious problems there. But those serious problems are also uh, in, inherent in the Buddhist modernist project. The Sangha that we see today, for example, just the example I'm most familiar with is, say, the Thai Sangha. The Thai Sangha today, the, the Thai monks that you see in Sydney, uh, in Annandale, or at uh, Lumia, or something like that, are, are ordained in the W order, which was founded originally by King Mongkut. King Mongkut, in the, in the, <coughs> obviously played by Yul Brenner, <laughs> and uh, before he was before he was Yul Brenner, he was a monk, and he uh, started this process of reform. Now, King Mongkut was a, a die-hard skeptic. I mean, I, I really don't think he believed in rebirth at all. I don't think he believed that it was possible to realize nibbana, and he would regularly shock the kind of the Western. Uh, uh, philosophers and intellectuals who he discussed with, with, with how sceptical he was about all of these kinds of things. And so he introduced the, a lot of these things into the monastic sangha, and they're actually found, you know, there to some degree. So that process has started, of course, one of my great problems is I think the process was started and it was then frozen, and that that spirit hasn't actually continued. Uh, so yes, my hope, obviously, as a monk, is that it is possible to keep on reinventing when you look in the actual real Sangha that's actually living in places like Thailand and Burma and so on, what you do see is an incredible diversity of people living in different kinds of ways and doing different kinds of things. Certainly not a monolithic institution, although uh, uh, it sometimes likes to give the impression that it is. Uh, well, John, just comment on that. Uh, should just change our dress code because essentially yeah. what you're saying is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you, you see monks and you find them inspiring. Well, and if they're we, living in the right way, yes. Well, yeah. Uh, well, now that's a whole yeah. other see, that, that, condition. Now, this back to that methodology. <laughs> what about, what about <laughs> not living secular? Uh, I remind you, when I was, I don't have to be when I was uh, 15, we had to read a little grammar book about. Um, uh, you know, ambiguous ways of constructing sentences, and one of the sentences was, uh, the minister wore no clothes to distinguish himself from the congregation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was a very Protestant, <laughs> it was a very Protestant idea, you know, of, of the, the, uh, the getting away from the priesthood and, um, and that sort of thing. And, and it just seems to me in the, you know, in, in the logic of, um, the way in which culture is developed, and we are getting away from the idea of uh, a priestly class. And then, while well, I know, you know, monks aren't priests, uh, they do have, to a large extent, that kind of function. And uh, and I think that uh, uh, we, when you have a situation where, um, for instance, like, uh, let me take Bulgam Sangha, I guess something like two thirds of the people who come to Bulgam Sangha have probably got tertiary degrees. They can read this, they, they know how to Google a sutra uh, and all that sort of thing. They don't need um, somebody who is a sort of um, a messenger or an intermediary between the Dharma and themselves. Just like, you know, the Protestant Reformation said you don't need a priest to stand between you and God. And um, so, um, you know, I, the, the monasticism seems to me it's a, it's a, it's a way of it's a personal choice of how to practice the Dharma. And it seems to me that in all the spiritual practice, you've got 
you've got fundamentally two roads here. One is an ascetic road, uh, and the other one follows the fullness of life. It's more a eudaimonic, which is the Greek term for a fully rounded human life. What, what one can maximally achieve as a finite human being <coughs> born to die. Uh, and these are two very different ways of practicing. It isn't a question of one being better than the other. It's just a question of you know, personal choice. So I see the Buddha as the, the, the bias. So in the Buddha's teaching, he's free to say no. Sorry? Oh, sorry. In the, uh, in the Buddha's teaching, what he's actually saying is that if you live the lay life, it's always going to be limited. Hmm. You're not going to get out. And um, in that sense, you might get to a certain way. But in actual fact, it is the, the spiritual commitment in terms of taking on, and which the Buddha wasn't actually a monastic. He was a spiritual practitioner that isolated himself in order to, to transcend in that sense. And then the order came out after that. So to one degree, it's a spiritual methodology that leads to enlightenment. Uh, but he clearly said the lay life is going to be limited in terms of what you can because you have to get involved with all the conditions of that and you have to step out of that to, to see further. The Buddha, had, the Buddha was obviously, of the two powers I was talking about, he chose the ascetic one. Mm. Uh, and under the you know, conditions of life at the time, uh, he probably had distinct advantages. Um, those advantages aren't so much there now because you know, we are um, we, we, uh, we can control fertility and we have an infinitely higher productivity of labour, which means we don't have to you know, work nearly as hard to get a meal every day. Um, so we, but, but there are quite two distinct ideas, there, I think, nonetheless. One is the Greek eudaimonic one, which I think most lay practitioners, at least in the secular tradition, will be following. And there's no apology about but that is as good as a way of developing oneself spiritually as the ascetic one. Can, can we just, um, it's just a thought I've been having about what you might see as some of the sorts of dangers or limitations of the secular. Um, if you sort of pull out your political economist hat and, and consider the ways in which um, secularization and rationalization have gone hand in hand with a sort of incorporation into um, global capitalism. And could we say that Buddhism is in danger of becoming another incorporation and that um, the more it's secularized, the more it can be lost and disappear and that actually the sort of the monastics are preserving, even if appearing to be conservative, they're preserving um, a radicalism that is um, in opposition to that um, degree of hatred and ignorance of capitalism. There's certainly a hard truth in that. Um, uh, there are ways, uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Carrot and King's book, Selling Spirituality. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of ways in which uh, the Dharma is commodified these days from, you know, the the, the extrapolation of particular practices and their commodification in you know, corporate training and <laughs> all that sort of thing. Um, but there is still a place for uh, very robust spiritual practice within you know, the heart of, um, of capitalist society. And there are also ways in which monastics can become, uh, uh, can be, become recruited <coughs> to all sorts of uh, nasty causes. I mean, it used to strike me in the, you know, the darkest days of the Howard government uh, when uh, you know, the, the systematic cruelty being visited on refugees by a cat called Philip Ruddick, who I went to school with. Um, and uh, and Ruddick was uh, also at some stage not only Minister for Immigration but of Citizenship or some such, and of multiculturalism, ironically. And he would always, uh, when he decided to be multicultural, he would organise a multicultural event, he would always have the other managed to muster up a bunch of um, 
Oh, Buddhist monastics. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even be seen in the same ballpark as the word rubbish. It was bad enough being the same playground as you. <laughs> Seven years ago, years ago, you know it was. Uh, but I mean, there seems to be uh, uh, a certain lack of uh, of moral judgment going on in that sort of um, display of uh, of acceptance or solidarity with people who are well beyond the pale in terms of Buddhist morality. I went in and I have to say that I agree with that absolutely and you know I think that there's been uh, uh, an incredible and quite unconscionable level of moral cowardice that's been displayed by the, the Sangha in many respects. I'll just give you one example from my own experience. One of the first times I got in serious trouble with, with my own Sangha, long before even the Bikuni thing, uh, I was in uh, Singapore uh, giving some teachings and uh, <coughs> this was a time, I'm not sure if you remember, a few years ago there was a, a young Vietnamese guy who was bringing some heroin back, got busted in the Singapore <coughs> airport and given the death sentence. And it turns out that he'd never done, basically he had been a very clean living young guy who was just bringing these drugs back because his brother had been in debt or something like that and his brother kind of manipulated him or got him to bring it back as a one-time thing. And he was given the death sentence for this. Now, when I was in Singapore, uh, someone sent me an email from Sydney saying that people in the, someone in the Dhamma circles in Sydney have been saying that they're sure that Bhante Sujato would support the death penalty for this kind of thing. So I wrote an email back saying I most certainly do not support the death penalty for this kind of thing. I don't support the death penalty for anything. And frankly, I don't think that it should be, basically, I don't think it should be a criminal offence at all, actually. Uh, and uh, I criticised the, uh, uh, the policy of the Singapore government. Uh, I was in Singapore at the time, and I discussed this with the people in the Buddhist society there, and we had quite a nice chat about it. Didn't think much about anything of it until a few months later, there'd been a Sangha meeting in Thailand. Somebody had brought this up, and I had been roundly condemned by the Sangha for making this point on the uh, grounds that, uh, well, it might make it difficult for monks to get visas in Singapore in the future. <laughs> that was the reason given. Yeah? Now, that's, that's dead straight, OK? That's the kind of thing we're seeing. So I, I agree with you completely that, that it's very easy and quite normal for the sun to become co-opted to the national uh, agenda and so on and so forth. It can happen, it does happen, shouldn't happen, uh, but it doesn't always happen. There are also other cases where people do stand up, but I think that's a fair enough point. I just wanted to come back briefly and just make a, a point on, on Giles' point earlier. Um, you know, Giles said where he feels inspired by the sight of the Sangha, and this is something that is mentioned in the suttas and things like that, but I just wanted to, just my own observation as a monk is that this, um, Wearing the robes and having the, the outward appearance of the monastic, um, it does. Th th there is something about. There's a charisma. There's an indefinable something. It, inv it, it invites all kinds of projections in a very strong way. And, and, and the whole kind of transference, counter transference thing, which talked about in psychology and so on, it's very palpable, and you can see it happening. And that, to me, that that thing, there's clearly some kind of energy there. I think the energy, personally, I think the energy is quite neutral in the sense that it can be used for good or for bad mm -hmm. yeah, and can very easily become corrupted and, and it often does. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing, but it can, I think it can also be used for good and I think it can, can be used to, to, um, uh, to focus and to motivate a great deal of energy and a great deal of strength if it's used in the right way. So, shall we wind it up? Shall we take another question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? Question. I think one question. Oh, yes, back there. Some people might want to leave to go now. Oh, yes, if you want to go. Um, don't forget to donate on your way out. <laughs> um, thank you for the discussion. It's, it's really good. Um, thank you an endless degree of ambiguity on defining Buddhism. And it seems to be quite rhetorical. It just goes back and forth. And, and, and these establishments of traditions that have sought to redefine Buddhism to define Buddhism again and again and again. And Krishnamurti was once famous for saying, nobody listened to him, that's why there is Buddhism. 
And my, my question is, it seems that it's two sides of the same coin, where when we look at traditional forms of Buddhism that, that have established themselves, um, they've brought on animistic beliefs, say in Thailand, that have incorporated themselves into the tradition. Um, there's, there's always going to be a degree of preconception there um, that, that will shape the idea of how Buddhist practice is, is to be established within a tradition. Within Western sort of uh, secular traditions, there, there's the scientific rationalism, that there's this preconceived notion that comes from the science where, where the whole projection of Buddhism is shaped around um, the, the preconceived notion. So everything, every examination of, uh, of the suttas, the texts, everything is, is based around these preconceptions um, in, in both traditional and, and in secular forms. I see, see them both as, to an extent, a gross contradiction of, of the Buddha sitting under the tree after giving up all his uh, past teachers uh, practices and, uh, and and starting to work it out for himself, so to speak. So I was wondering if you had any comments um, on that. All this becomes clear, like everything else, if you look at it historically. Buddhism did not exist until the 1820s, uh, when the Europeans, um, who were going around the world discovering things, discovering countries, discovering all sorts of things. And what they, one of the things they discovered was Buddhism. No one had ever heard of it before that. You, know, you could imagine a uh, Vajrayana practitioner from Ladakh going to Theravada in Sri Lanka and wondering what the hell this was all about. Uh, but it was the Europeans who discovered uh, that there were all these very, very different traditions that they could actually um, kind of aggregate into something they call Buddhism. So the very first uh, uh, description of Buddhism was published in 1844 in France by a bloke called Eugène Verouf. And uh, it was a very comprehensive account of Buddhism, uh, phenomenally um, misleading, and led to all the entirely false conceptions of Buddhism you find in Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and uh, all the rest of them. Uh, so uh, the, the point that I want to make there is that, uh, that Bournouf was not really looking at a thing. He thought he was. He was projecting uh, a sort of um, inner coherence on the folk ways and social practices of vastly different cultures. Uh, if we fast forward to right now, and someone like um, a you know, prominent writer in the area, uh, Bernard Faure, another froggy, um, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's not my favourite writer by any means, but he is making the point that no matter what generalisation uh, you think might capture the essence of Buddhism just won't hold water. There is no essence to it. Uh, there's certainly plenty of people running around saying we're the real Buddhists and all the rest of the, you know, the fakes. Uh, but uh, I think it's much better to see um, to see uh, the Dharma as an arena in which many voices are speaking. There's a certain lingua franca going on, um, but um, no one is really in a position to say we're the real McCoy and you know, the rest of you are fakes. I mean, certain, certain, certain versions of Buddhism, you know, an overwhelming majority of Buddhists would say we're pretty flaky or not really, uh, you know, obviously lost the plot. But, um, but the idea of a true Buddhism or a real Buddhism or something like that is, um, it is really a, a product of the overheated European imagination. Well, I mean, certainly it's the case that what's presented to us as Buddhism is, is a pre-digested thing. Yeah? Uh, and of course you can't you know, really capture the complexity of um, Buddhism is different all over the place. But just one, one thing I, I would not agree with in that is, is I, 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 I do think that there's something as vague, indefinable, or whatever. I don't, I don't think the vagueness or indefinability of it is the, the point. But within the Buddhist communities, before the modern era, yeah, I do believe 
that there was still something about those people that thought of themselves as Buddhist, which they saw as, for example, different from Hindu or something like that, or Jaina or whatever, and which was actually seen in a genuine sense as being related to what other Buddhists were doing in other places. Yes, certainly in a sectarian sense as well. Yes, we're, we're real Buddhism and they're not real Buddhists. Just to give an example, the 11th century, a Sri Lankan monk went from Sri Lanka to Tibet uh, and took with him some copies of the Dhammachakravatana Sutta, which was translated into Tibetan and incorporated in the Tibetan canon. So now one of the texts in the Tibetan official canon is a translation of the Sinhalese recension of the Dhammachakravatana Sutta, along with another seven or eight different versions of the same sutta already present within the Tibetan canon. Um, around the same period of time we had uh, ordinations being carried out from Tibet to China. Similarly, ordination, bhikkhuni ordination carried out from Sri Lanka to China. Uh, and many, there were many kind of stories like this. I do, but I do think that, yes, there was a degree, a, a large degree of, of, of isolation and insularity and so on. But there was something about those people where they thought of themselves as Buddhist, somehow, whatever that meant. Uh, two, two, yes, two quick questions. Yes, let's take this last question. Um, part A would be, are secular Buddhists atheist or agnostic on transcendence? And the second part would be, um, I'm just wondering if, if one's goal, so there is only one life or there are multiple lives, reflects one's ambition, so awakening versus awakened, the goal is to be progressively less suffering in this single life versus the fear of that well, I'm going to go through the suffering perhaps trillions of times and therefore I'm going to perhaps make a different quality of effort because I don't want to have to do this trillions of times. I'm just wondering if there's a, a different goal, so one single life versus multiple lifetimes reflects um, the amount of motivation or the effort. There is no um, secular Buddhist canon or orthodoxy, um, but I think um, you know, the main body of secular Buddhism uh, would uh, would um, not uh, not have the, any idea of rebirth uh, to inform its practice. There is this life, and the reason why um, I guess the idea of rebirth is unpopular, apart from the fact that it's sort of highly counterintuitive in terms of our uh, cultural preconditions, is that um, is that it is blocking a very important uh, idea, particularly in uh, continental philosophy, uh, of finitude. That it is really important that we understand our limitations in order to be able to make um, effective decisions and commitments as to how we live our life in a hate. Heidegger called it being towards death. And uh, there's a fantastic novel about this. I can tell you a very recent novel by a Swiss German writer called uh, Pascal Mercier called Night Train to Wisdom. And it is a wonderful Evocation of this whole idea of finitude and how it informs <coughs> a life well lived. Uh, so, I guess that's why, um, you know, thinking of, of this in terms of you know multiple lifetimes is not helpful from a from a secular point of view. What was the second question, or have I answered both? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so how does that affect your, your, your commitment to effort? Mm. Oh, well, the commitment to effort, I think, is... Um, look, when I started um, started as a Dharma practitioner, it was uh, in, a, in a pretty religious outfit, uh, which really did push rebirth a lot. And a few, and a few you know, the comrades were sceptical, and, uh, and the teacher said, well, if you don't believe in rebirth, you'll have to redouble your effort to become 
enlightened in this lifetime. I thought, well, fair enough. Um, you know, uh, and I had a I had a friend who started with me, who used to say, oh God, you know, meditation is too difficult. I'll put it off to the next life. <laughs> and um, and you know, I mean, it was sort of we all had to laugh about that. But it's a sort of uh, it's it's an, an available prevarication, I guess, if you do believe in in multiple lives. So if you don't believe in multiple lives, uh, you get a bit better get cracking. Doesn't the converse doesn't the converse also apply? If you believe in trillions of lives, let's say, and therefore a trillion times of suffering, and if you're motivated by the suffering you're experiencing in this life, how much more would you be motivated by experiencing that for eons? Yeah, look, um, I, I think most people aren't as convinced that their lives are entirely made up of suffering. You know, I think that. Um, then why do we I, I, I tend to err towards the Greek view here. You know, we have the tragic vision that there is a there is a, a lot of shit happens, you know, in any life. But a lot of other things happen too, and the whole idea of wanting to um, uh, wanting to curtail one's life or lives uh, again isn't. I don't think it is. Um, I don't think it's a very compelling idea. In contemporary culture, just, I mean, just the Greek view was also that we had a never-ending never series of uh, rebirths and reincarnations, as was held by the majority or just about all of the important Greek philosophers. So that's there as well. But anyway, uh, I, but I agree, agree with the point. I, th I don't think it actually in practical. Uh, terms, one or other view is going to mean you're going to practice or not practice. I think really what it matters is how it's applied, how it's uh, the particular personalities, and that's something that we really haven't got into, which is another, I think, very important thing is that that actually, and this is fundamental to the Buddhist self-perception of why there are different forms of Buddhism, is because different teachings appeal to different personalities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's all of the all of the teaching schools say that. But they just say that their own personality is better <laughs> than everyone else's personality. Uh, so I think the, the crucial matter is well, what does it mean to, to this particular person and how does that affect them? And yes, belief in rebirth was clearly you know, taught in the suttas as a means of urging people to be more um, diligent. Um, and yet the practical impact very largely in, in Buddhist culture uh, is that, oh, well, I can give a bit of dharma and then I'll get reborn in heaven. And then that's that's good enough for me. <laughs> there was a very famous book written by a Burmese monk called In This Very Life, which is a quote from the Buddha. That's, yeah. In, in so he wasn't Buddhist. against that. Pandita. Yeah, the secular Buddhists have an after Well, can we just answer <laughs> this a bit? But um, I think that there, there's sort of a range of soft and hard secularists, so that there are some possibly soft secularists who would remain agnostic on rebirth and consider that to either affirm or, or deny is, um, it, you know, you're, you're slipping into um, uh, an absolute on either side and that actually if you understand that our worldviews are conditioned, then, you know, how can we know? So is it better to, to stay in that agnostic position and allow all your other psychological forces to to urge you to practice. Mm. Mm. I think that we're going to have to uh, <laughs> soft moderate. to the conversation, and that is, why am I attracted to secular Buddhism? I, I find that um, secular Buddhism relates to my human condition, the often repeated phrase in Linton's presentation that the key to Buddhist studies is their focusing on the human condition. I'm really curious about my own hu human condition and how I live my life now. I'm really interested how I live my life now 
on this earth, in this society, with the issues that we are dealing with, and how I get the courage and the um, energy and uh, the truth in me to speak out and to act the best I can uh, with this, um, Andrew is talking about doing as much as I can in this life to improve or to um, contribute. Um, and, and I have a problem a little bit with this transcendent, transcendental, trans, what do you call it? Transcendental. Transcendental uh, side of rebirth, some God figure, and others, which are non-experiential. I really like the, the um, emphasis on the human condition because I, I have turned to Buddhism because of the, the experiential nature. And that is that I can check things against my own experience. And as soon as there is talk about some other things in other worlds, another very theoretical, I'm very interested in I, I really like washing my brain in the soup of this sort of intellectual talk. And I'm, I think I'm quite good at it sometimes. But I, I, what really grounds me and draws me to Buddhism is the experiential nature of it and going back to my own heart, my own guts, my own bones my blood and being able to listen uh, and to come back to my own senses and to be able to not escape. I'm very good at being absent-minded and going to my brain and going to some kind of dream states and so on. And I think a lot of people have that. And we live in a society that's half awake, that, I mean, Buddha lived in a society that was half awake. And, and, and this, this, this idea about being awake and this kind of being awake to what am I doing in this world now? Okay, wait, thank you very much. I think perhaps we need to take care of this human condition by uh, winding up and going home to sleep. Um, so I'd like to thank both um, Bante Sajatun and Lyndon Higgins for a very uh, interesting discussion. And I think we can see that there are, there are many layers and um, aspects to this discussion that could go on and on. and develop into a whole conference, um, so perhaps one day that might happen, and I'd like to thank you all for coming and for supporting the Cambodia project. Thank you very much.